Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. So most courses on signals and systems that talk about Laplace transforms will say, oh, let's talk about how to do partial fraction expansions, and then we'll apply that to differential equations. Here, I would like to just go ahead and plunk down an example of solving a differential equation and then seeing where partial fraction expansions come into play. Let's say we have a differential equation y dot plus 3y equals ut. I'll have a habit of forgetting to put the y here. Let me know if I do that. There's a convention we're using here where dots indicate time derivatives, and books on differential equations will generally implicitly assume the dependence on the time variable, and they won't bother to actually write it out to try to keep the notation compact. So what's on the right here, we might think about as the input to the system. And here we're looking at a particular input ut. Later we'll make this more generic, and we'll see that for the most part, what we're interested in is not the exact solution of some differential equation for some quote unquote input here on the right hand side but a more general understanding about how a system might respond to a general class of inputs. Now, we're also going to be sort of extending our definition of a system a little bit. We said a system was a thing that mapped inputs to outputs, but now we'll also have a concept of an internal state of the system, and it's that state that shows up manifest as initial conditions. So here we'll say we have pre-initial condition, I'm saying pre because I'm putting this little minus sign in the superscript there. And as we move along, I'll tell you why I'm very particular about that compared to most instructors and in textbooks. So we'll say that this pre-initial condition is 2 in this particular example. Okay, so let me take the Laplace transforms of both sides of this expression. On the left, I'll have an S coming out in front of capital YS by the derivative property. But remember, the property also says that I need to subtract this pre-initial condition. So the Laplace transform of little y is just big Y. And on the right here, the Laplace transform of a unit step function is 1 over s. And what is y at the time origin here? Well, it's just 2. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lump everything with a capital Y on it together on the left-hand side and factor out that capital YS, and then I'm going to move everything that doesn't have a capital Y in it over to the right-hand side. So I'll now have 2 plus 1 over S. So now I want an explicit expression for big Y of S, so I will divide this 2 here by S plus 3, and here I'll have 1 over S, the existing S, and now I'm dividing it by S plus 3. And at this point, I could take a couple of approaches. I could put an S here and an S down here and put everything over a common denominator and then work the rest of the problem. But there's a particular point that I want to make in this lecture that will benefit from me keeping these terms separate. So what I'm going to do here is I'll just copy this first term and write 2 over S plus 3. And for the second term, I'll write this in terms of a partial fraction expansion. I'll write a over s plus b over s plus 3. There's a lot of textbooks that instead of different letters like a and b, they'll use something like c1, c2, et cetera, et cetera. I found that using subscripts like this as numbers tends to be error prone. If you call them completely distinct letters, I think it's easier to keep track of them. Uh, so notice I'm using different colors here to indicate the results of these particular terms. So now in this partial fraction expansion, I need to figure out what the terms a and b are. Let me write that as a separate thing. So 1 over s, s plus 3 equals a over s plus b over s plus 3. And now there's a couple of approaches you could make. One approach would be to clear the fraction you would multiply all the terms on both sides of the expression by this denominator. So on the left, you would wind up with 1 over a s plus 3 plus b times s. Then you would match up the terms according to their particular powers of s. So s to the 0 
Well, that's just sort of our, our constant term. I'll have 1 on the left-hand side equaling 3a on the right-hand side. And now if I match up all of the s to the power of 1 terms, I'll wind up with 0 on the left-hand side because there's no s terms over here on the left. And I wind up with a plus b. I'm getting an a from here and a b from here. So this is pretty easy to solve. I wind up with a is equal to 1 third and b is equal to minus a third. And for small cases, that's perfectly fine. But what I found is that once you start having a lot of terms, this can get pretty complicated, particularly if you wind up with this big matrix equation to solve in order to find all of the constants. Because this approach essentially forces you to find all of these coefficients at once. But as we'll see later, there are some cases where you may only really care about what B is in terms of finding an exact number. And that particular problem you're trying to solve, A may be of less importance to you. So I'm not hugely fond of this method, and I'm not going to use it very often at all for the rest of the course. This is the method that I learned in school. And I didn't find out about this other method called the residue method until I was a professor. And I learned this from another professor, Dr. Jennifer Michaels. So here I'm just going to show you an example of the method. I'm not going to bother here to explain why this method works. You can go look that up if you want. To make some space, let me move our answers that we computed with the clear the fraction method up a bit. And I'll get rid of the details of the method. So here's how the technique works. I'm going to write down the expression that I'm trying to expand, which is on the left-hand side here. And now I'm going to multiply it by the denominator of the term that I'm finding the coefficient for. So I'm finding the coefficient for a, so I'm going to multiply it by s. And then I'm going to evaluate it at the root of this denominator. And that root is what makes that denominator be 0. So here I'll write s equals 0. We'll also see that this also goes by the name of a pole. OK, so the main thing that happens here is this s cancels with this s. And I'm left with 1 over s plus 3 evaluated at s equals 0, which gives me 1 over 3. OK, so let's use the same trick to find b. I'm expanding 1 over s, s plus 3, and I'm going to multiply it by s plus 3 because that's the denominator of the term that has b in it. And then we evaluate it at the root, which makes this denominator 0. So that's going to be s equals minus 3. The s plus 3s cancel, and I'm left with 1 over s equal 1 over minus 3. Well, let's just write that as minus 1 over 3. So the a and b here that I found with the residue method match the a and b I found with the fraction clearing method. This is also often called the heavy side cover-up method because it was popularized by an engineer named Oliver Heaviside, a very interesting character, was not as appreciated as he should have been in his own time. He tended to develop and use a lot of mathematical techniques that mathematicians felt didn't have a solid enough theoretical basis, although people later looked at his work and found some better foundations for it. And basically, that foundation turned out to be the Laplace transform. He would be doing a lot of these Laplace-style calculations without formally invoking the Laplace transform formalism. And it's called the heavy side cover-up method because if you imagine going through a series of terms like this, these cancellations make it look like you're going through the various factors of the denominator and covering each of them up to make them go away, one in turn, uncovering the previous ones as you're going along. So now I can take this a and b and substitute it back into our Laplace transform. So let me write y s is equal to 2 over s plus 3 plus 1 third over s. And you'll see in a second why it's kind of convenient to have a 1 third up here instead of having a 3 in the denominator, minus 1 third s plus 3. So that's just plugging in our answers for a and b. But I'm not done yet. I still need to invert this Laplace transform. I'll have 2 e to the minus 3t ut. I think that's the first Laplace transform that we did. Plus 1 third e to the minus t ut minus 1 third 
e to the minus 3t ut. So there's a caveat on this answer that I want to put in that this is for t bigger than or equal to zero, but I'll wait till the end to put in that caveat. So at this point, let me go ahead and simplify things. 2 here is the same as 6 over 3, so if I were to subtract a third from that, I would get 5 thirds e to the minus 3t, and I'll deal with this ut in a moment, and then I'll have plus 1 over 3 e to the minus t, and I'll factor out the ut out of everything. And now I would like to put in an important caveat. I like to write 4t bigger than or equal to 0. In all of these kinds of differential equations that we're solving, we're not really making any statements about what's happening for t less than 0. We're certainly not saying that it's 0 for t less than 0, even though we have this big ut sitting here. The Laplace transform essentially can't tell us very much about what happened in the past. So I think it's better for us to explicitly remain agnostic about it. Now, most differential equations books, or possibly all differential equations books, I haven't seen them all, won't explicitly write this caveat, but I really like to put it there, especially if we have u sitting here. I don't want the presence of this u to give anyone the impression that y of t was definitely zero for all time. That is distinctly not what we're claiming. So you might include this caveat and then not bother to write the ut. That would still be technically a correct answer, but I like to do this for overkill. And I've gone back and forth on this. Having this u here can bring some confusion, but I think overall it's better to have it in there, but who knows, maybe I'll change my mind next year. Now, if you trace the various terms in our intermediate answers back to the original problem, you'll see that you can put some interpretations on these various terms. This term with the two in it came from the initial condition. So those kinds of terms are referred to as either the natural response, or sometimes you'll see them referred to as the zero input response. Whereas the terms here in light blue, those came from the presence of this unit step function and the quote unquote input. So this is sometimes called the force response, because this is being forced by the input, or it's also called the zero initial condition response. And here we can broaden our definition of linearity a little bit to include systems that have this idea of an internal state. The system has to have the scaling and superposition property individually in the input and also individually in the initial conditions but it also has to have a superposition property between the input and the initial conditions. And for any of these systems with state that I will show you in the remainder of 3084 that we're characterizing in terms of linear differential equations with constant coefficients, this will be the case. And intriguingly, notice that although this one-third e to the minus t term came strictly from the forced response, the term with the five-thirds in front of it here came from a combination of the natural response and the forced response. And it got its character, this e to the minus 3t, from the 3 that was sitting here. That was inherently part of the structure of the system.